Hey everyone. In this video, I want to talk about what is Azure. I have a whole bunch of different videos on this channel going into deep dives about certain technologies and how we architect certain services. But someone asked me, how would I actually explain what is Azure? So that's the goal of this video. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated, and hit that bell icon. So before I think about Azure, let's actually think about your data center. So really, what is the data center you are using today? I can think about, well, I have some kind of physical facility, and that physical facility really is all about capacity. It has certain types of capacity. Now, that capacity could be storage. Now, I might have different types of storage. That storage might give me different capacities, kind of gigabytes per dollar. It might have different IOPS characteristics. It might have different throughput characteristics. But it's giving me this kind of capacity for data. And then I think about, well, I have a whole set of kind of compute capacity. So I have servers with CPUs and memory. Um, they have network connectivity. And there's also this kind of connectivity between the storage. Maybe it's direct attached, maybe it's a SAN operating over a dedicated maybe fiber connection, maybe it's a NAS device operating over the network. But fundamentally, my data center is really providing me a whole set of capacity. Now, that capacity on its own is really not super useful. So what we do is we put services on top of that. So obviously a very common one is we think about, well, there are kind of virtual machines. And inside that VM, there's a certain operating system. I might have lots and lots of these. Now, obviously, when I think about this layer here, the VM, there's a whole set of work to be done. There's an OS. I have to patch it. I have to maintain it. I have to do antivirus. I have to do maybe DR. I have to do backup. I have to do config. There's, there's a whole list of things that has to be done. Now, on top of that virtual machine, I might have other things. I might do containers. So I think about, oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting more advanced. I have kind of maybe some containers on here. I might have kind of an orchestrator like Kubernetes running on top of that to orchestrate that whole thing. I might offer kind of uh, database services. I might have certain kind of app services. So I'm offering all of these different things. And so really all of that is still kind of building block stuff until I actually run my kind of business application that kind of sits on top of all of those different things. Now these things themselves, like database requires tuning, it requires config, it requires, again, maintenance. So there's a whole set of stuff to do. But fundamentally, my data center is about, well, I've got this capacity, and then on top of that capacity, I offer various types of service. So maybe my IT department offers VMs, they offer containers, they might offer databases. And then the business units themselves would actually go and consume those services. Because the whole point is, the business users themselves, so imagine I'm over here, uh, kind of I'm a business user, I have no direct access to that capacity. What I have access to are the services that my IT department project that are built on that capacity. Now they do that through various kind of tooling. So there's tools here that the IT department might use to do certain things. So I could think about how kind of IT here has a certain set of tools to maybe interact with all the other areas. So I kind of do management, but then the user, so this could be a, a business user, for example, they probably go in and kind of make requests. Now, depending on the environment, that request may be a service ticket that then goes to the IT department who do governance. They do checks and balances to make sure you're not doing something that breaks regulations, that you're within a certain quota, maybe. Maybe you even have tooling that has like private cloud, 
hey, I have a self-service, I have chargeback, I'm pooling my resources, you may have those various things available to you. So we're taking that capacity, we're building services on top of that, and then we can offer those services to kind of our business users, but this is all within our company. Now, when I think about how I'm actually consuming those services, well, that user is sitting somewhere. Now, it's possible that usage is just on kind of a private network. It could be, for example, hey, I'm on a, a certain location. Maybe I have an office building kind of over here. We'll say that's a building and not a server because it's got a door. And we have some kind of network connection between them. And that would obviously have some kind of latency associated with that. I, depending on how far away my office is, it's gonna impact kind of my performance to that. But also, I might have external users. I might have external users that wanna come in and offer my services. So then we add other things. We have things like firewalls. We have things like DMZs to actually have some separation that they would go through from the internet to actually consume my services. So now we have a whole set of other things we have to think about. Well, are our data centers close to where the users are because of that whole latency thing? Um, how's our security? How do we really handle all of those things? So it's entirely possible I may actually have multiple data centers. Depending on where people are, I might have kind of another data center over here. And once again, we have some kind of private network to connect them together. It's kind of my data center too. And then finally, we can kind of think about, well, hey, I have this user. Well, that user has to kind of exist somewhere. So we have an identity provider, an IDP. Most of the time, this is Active Directory. And so the user kind of has an account in here. And all of these services trust that identity provider to do a good job, make sure they're checking various things. It really is who they say they are. And so then it gets used. So we can really think about, hey, my data center is just capacity, storage, compute, network, maybe specialized, maybe GPUs, special things. And on top of that capacity, we add services that we enable to be used by the business users in our organization. And it really is nothing more than that. that. That's really what our data center is. Okay, now realize when I run my own data center, there's a ton of stuff I have to think about. There's a physical location, there's a power bill, water bill, cooling, insurance, the whole capital expenditure of actually buying the servers, the network switches, the storage, uh, the people to maintain that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff to all of that. And of course, they're still monitoring and security and everything else. So let's talk about Azure. That's the whole point of this talk. So I actually saw a t-shirt and the t-shirt was actually funny. It was like, there's no such thing as the cloud, it's just someone else's data center. And although there's a little bit more to it than that, there's a certain amount of truth to that. So when I think about Azure, it's really all about capacity again. So let's say we draw this great big Azure cloud. So we'll just say, hey, this is Azure. Now if I think about Azure, it's a whole set of capacity. Now there's capacity in terms of storage. There's capacity in terms of network. And there's capacity in terms of compute. Huge ranges of different types of service, uh, some more memory to CPU, to IOPS, uh, hard disk drive, SSDs, NVMEs, all different types of network technologies but we don't see any of that. So there's all these different types of capacity under the hood, but we do not have any access to that raw capacity. I'm not responsible for that raw capacity. I don't really care about it. So once again, yes, there's a whole set of kind of capacity down here, but what I really care about are the services that get built on top of that capacity that I get access to. So there are building blocks. 
I can think about, well, there's things like storage accounts. There's things like managed disks. There's things like virtual networks. And then there's very basic things like, hey, virtual machines. And once again, kind of there's an OS in there. So we have these kind of core building block type things that I can create. So at a very, very basic level, yeah, there, there's VMs in Azure, there's storage accounts in Azure. I can create blobs and tables and queues and files. I can create a network with subnets. And that real base set of services, you'll, you'll often hear kind of this IaaS, infrastructure as a service. And that's going to kind of be most familiar with what most of us are used to on-prem. As a business user, I can go to my corporate IT and say, hey, I need a VM. If they're more sophisticated, maybe they offer you containers. Uh, maybe they have a set of databases that I can get a database from. But I'm used to going in and kind of operating that VM level, then I have OSs I have to manage, etc., etc. And that would be the same here. If I just go to kind of that VM level, once again, well, hey, there's backup considerations, there's DR, there's config, there's antivirus, there, there's a whole set of different things. But in Azure, there's a whole set of kind of extensions and services that can really help do that for me, including things like an auto manage that's really a, a management by exception. It just kind of does its thing. So that seems familiar. But the real power of Azure is when we go beyond that. Yes, I can create tons of VMs, massive scale, really, really quickly, fantastic. But it's a whole set of things that build on those building blocks. So once again, yes, there's things like, in fact, I'll use a different color to start. There are things like kind of containers. There's containers as a service. Um, there's containers where there's then a managed kind of Kubernetes, it's AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service, that is a managed Kubernetes deployment running in your environment. But there's also kind of specialized app services across a whole bunch of runtimes, a bunch of languages. I can have serverless, serverless functions. I can have drag and drop canvases where I create logic apps, say, hey, some trigger from this, go and do these events to something else. Hey, uh, I see a tweet, um, go and write something to SharePoint. Go and call machine learning to do a sentiment analysis. Was it positive or negative? There's database services. This could be things like SQL, SQL. It could be managed versions of open source solutions like Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB. They were born for the cloud data services like Cosmos DB these NoSQL implementations. And then there are all these massive other kind of services, machine learning, IoT. I mean, the list is massive. And a good way to actually see that is if we go and look at the services page of Azure, these are all the products. You know, it's a whole bunch of AI and machine learning services, analytics services, blockchain, all these types of compute. So I talked about virtual machines. Okay, that's that very simple one there. But then there's things that build on that, like virtual machine scale sets that will auto create the VMs based on a template and auto scale based on workload. That auto scaling is a core part of the cloud, which we're going to get to in a second. Virtual desktop. Hey, I can actually run a whole virtual desktop environment in Azure. App services, container services, database services, developer tools, DevOps, the list kind of goes on and on and on. So one of the key things we think about is sure, on premises we have this idea that we have this capacity and we offer a few services to our business users. VMs, maybe if we're sophisticated containers, maybe we have a few templates, so it pre-deploys a certain application maybe. But we're really, really focused on that kind of VM or container world. Well, in Azure, it's really, yes, we have these things you can absolutely use, but ideally you're really thinking about a lot of these PaaS solutions because it's not necessarily doing a business function, but all of that plumbing, I'm not responsible for patching or backing up or antivirus now. What I focus on as the customer is my application. What is providing the business value? 
I can just focus on my app that differentiates me from someone else. I can deploy that and I'm done. I'm not now focusing on maintaining all these other things that don't really bring value. And then you'll actually see things like software as a service. So an example of that could be something like Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, that actually does a business function. So that's kind of those, those key components. So they, they all kind of build on each other. And you use what makes sense for you. Now ideally, if there's a SaaS solution that does what you want, fantastic, use that. If there's not and you're building it, we'll use the PaaS components that work for you. Maybe you're lifting and shifting or it just has, doesn't make sense for some reason. I can use virtual machines. You have choice. But all of these are kind of available in that Azure environment. And I talked about auto scale. So remember, on premises, I talked about all those costs. Hey, I have to buy the disks. I have to buy the servers. I buy the network switches. I have the data center. I have the racks. I have to kind of do this capital expenditure to buy in advance for what I think I might need for the next two, three, four, five years. If I have this varying load per day, per week, per month, I have to have the capacity of that peak all of the time. I'm always paying for that peak capacity. So the whole point of the cloud for all of these things is it is consumption based. I pay for what I'm using. If at this minute I need 10 VMs or 20 containers, I pay for that. If the next minute I need 100, I pay for that. If the next minute I need three, I pay for that. So based on the load, that's the resource I can have. So all of these things have kind of this auto scale capability. So I'm only spending based on the things I actually need. And that's a huge difference. On-prem, I have to be equipped to handle the peak and it's there all the time. In the cloud, I pay for what I need. And also think about, hey, my requirements may change. I can easily change the type of resource I'm using. I don't have this hardware that's mine that I've just bought. I need to make sure I'm getting the most out of it. I can delete these and create other types of things at any time I want. Now, if I know I need a certain type of resource for a really long time, well, there's the ability to get kind of these reserved set of capacity and get a cheaper rates. So I, I can do that, but I don't have to do that. Now, one of the things you might wonder is, okay, I'm joining this cloud. And then I said, well, there's no such thing as a cloud, it's someone else's data center. So the reality is, when I use Azure, I actually use it really in terms of regions. So there are many regions around the world. And yes, those regions are made up of kind of data centers. So there are these data centers that actually power each region. And there are many, many other regions as well. So if I kind of, that's region one, well, I could think about over here, well, there's a kind of region two. There's a region three. There's a lot of different regions, and they're all connected to this massive Microsoft global network. So when I think about, hey, well, where is my office? Where are the people consuming these services? I want to make sure I have instances of those services close to them so they get good performance. And we can see all of the different regions. So this is a, a map. It's a globe of all the regions actually available in Azure. So actually, so you can kind of see all of the different regions available. And you can go and select any one of these. So all of those blue circles, well, that's a region. So there's South Central, and there's North Central, Central US, East US, US 2, West US to Canada East. There's a whole bunch in Europe. There's a whole bunch over here. You can keep kind of UAE North, India, Asia. There's one in China. There's Japan. 
there's Australia. So there's regions all throughout the world. And you see all these kind of dotted lines. That's Microsoft's where it has connectivity between them. So we have this massive network, this huge number of regions. And I can change this to kind of a map view so you can maybe see it more easily. But there's this huge number of regions. I can change actually what I'm seeing to make it a bit easier so I could turn off networking and ground stations for satellites and sustainability to just go and look at these are all the regions available for Azure. So I can go and create resources in all of these different places to really make sure, hey, I can have the best experience for my users or for the users I'm trying to actually offer services to. So I had those lines on this picture. So there is obviously a, a connectivity issue. So how do I connect and use these things? Now this Microsoft massive network, yes, it connects all of the Microsoft data centers, those regions together, but it also goes and hangs off to a whole bunch of kind of points of presence. And those points of presence might be where different internet vendors so some internet service provider, could be an AT&T, a Verizon, whoever, we're always trying, for all of the major ones, we want to be kind of one hop away from them. So we, and the internet is just a whole bunch of different networks connected together that are routable. So we have the Microsoft network goes and connects at these different points of presence. So from my location over the internet, I could do a site-to-site -site VPN, an encrypted tunnel over the internet to a virtual network in Azure. But another option I could actually do is I could think about, hey, my data center here, they also expand the Microsoft network into these locations called peering, these carrier neutral uh, fiber hotels in a way. And what I could actually do is I could have a connection to one of these meet me's. That could be a dedicated connection. It could be off of my MPLS. It might be this is a colo, and my data center is actually part of a colo, and I can just add it on there. But then I can get this private connection between my location and the Microsoft Backbone network, and then I can connect to virtual networks with private peering. I could even go and connect to other Microsoft services with Microsoft peering. So we have this private option with ExpressRoute. So it's a way I can connect to my office. If I want sort of very consistent latency, I want a private connection, I can do that. And then a whole point of kind of all of this service, we talked before on premises, you have tools. How do the users go and request things? How do I actually do those things? So if I think about Azure is all of these different capabilities well, there's a whole set of tooling for this. So there's a whole set of kind of management. There is a portal, there's PowerShell, there's a CLI, there are templates, so I can do a declarative kind of configuration of what I actually want deployed. And if you remember, hey, there was this IT person maybe standing between the business user asking for something and what my policies are. When the cloud, if I'm going to give users kind of this self-service, an important part is still governance. How do I ensure my policies are enforced? So we can have things like, well, what can they do? Well, we have things like Azure Policy. They are allowed to use these regions. They can use these types of storage accounts. They must have DR enabled. Um, they must have this replication enabled. I can control well, who can do it. There's very granular role-based access control. And then there's kind of well, how much can they do? This consumption-based thing could get out of hand if people just create a whole bunch of stuff. Well, there's the ability to create budgets at many different levels. So these whole sets of controls I can actually have in place. And of course, for all of these things, there's a whole set of kind of security services. You'll hear about things like Defender, which have specialist Defender and looking for certain signals on data services and compute services, more general ones like DNS and Azure Resource Manager. 
And there's a whole set of monitoring solutions, both for kind of core infrastructure, but also your application. It can go and hook into your app, um, your J2E, your .NET, others with APIs, say, hey, this function calls taking, so you can actually give me insight into my app to see, well, hey, is it performing as we expected? Um, is there some problem coming? Things like Sentinel, a SIM source solution to help me actually see if there's issues, instance happening, and then respond to them, build on top of a lot of these solutions. And then for all of this, just like on-prem, well, I mentioned RBAC, and how do I actually do identity for this? Well, the identity provider, my IDP, is Azure AD a cloud identity provider that talks cloud. And one of the great things I can do is, hey, I already have kind of my on-prem identity provider here. I can absolutely have this process to actually kind of synchronize and give the user a seamless experience. They don't really know there's a separate one, but then through this Azure AD, I can add additional value like risk detection. I can look for instance of identity protection. I have things like conditional access to have additional checks and requirements based on what I'm doing or what I'm accessing. There's things like cloud MFA. Uh, I can hook into password list solutions. There's all these other things I can do through Azure. So really Azure is not magic. It's capacity in regions. But the key thing is there's this huge range of services I can leverage, a huge set of very powerful tooling around how I can use it, how I can do my governance. And one thing you may have heard of is, hey, maybe I still need to do some of this stuff on-prem, but I want a consistent model. I want to still be able to use these fantastic security mechanisms, these management mechanisms. So what you may have seen is kind of Azure Arc. So Azure Arc is about taking a lot of these management and these governance, um, these services, and actually applying it to my on-premises environment. It can build on top of it. It can just do it for regular operating systems. But if you have a CNCF compatible Kubernetes environment, it can then manage that and it can deploy onto it to then bring the richer services like database services and app services and machine learning to your on-prem environment, but as Azure services. So it's really giving me this very rich hybrid environment. So that was maybe more detail, maybe more involved, but to answer that question, when I think about what is Azure, Azure is capacity in the cloud, right, connected networks, that I can consume, yes, from the internet, but also through private connections. But what really sets it apart is this powerful set of different services built on that capacity that are evergreen, they're managed for me. I don't have to worry about that. I just use that service and apply my business logic on top of that. It has a huge set of powerful tooling and governance and security and monitoring solutions. And hey, if I still need to do some stuff on-prem, you know, Azure Arc will let me bring that there. So that's my answer to kind of what is Azure. Um, I hope that was useful. Until next time, take care.